I'm very, very happy to be able to introduce uh, David Palumbo Lu, who is a professor of comparative literature at Stanford University. Um, he is the founding editor of the e-journal Occasion, Interdisciplinary Studies in the Humanities, and a contributing editor for the Los Angeles Review of Books. He writes very widely for uh, publicly accessible outlets. Uh, he just circulated yesterday the article that he did for Truth Out. He's published a lot with Salon, The Nation, Alternet, The Guardian, and other such venues. It's an important aspect, I think, of his intellectual work, is functioning as a public intellectual. And he also has a very long list of academic publications. I'll just mention the three most recent. Correct me if there are any mistakes. The Deliverance of Others, Reading Literature in a Global Age from 2012, uh, Duke University Press. An edited compilation on Emanuel Wallerstein, entitled Emanuel Wallerstein and the Problem of the World, System, Scale, Culture, 2011, also with Duke University Press. And then Asian American, Historical Crossings of a Racial Frontier with Stanford in 1999. In discussing how we were going to frame the uh, conversation today, we thought that we would begin by both sharing about 15 minutes of talking points around the theme of uh, anti-fascism, education today, and kind of current student struggles, but then also given that it's the 50-year anniversary of 68, I think there'll be some historical resonances that will come out. And so we'll begin with, uh, David will share some thoughts with you or with all of us, and then I will do the same. So Great. without further ado, I'll turn it over to David. Okay, well thanks so much to Gabriel for organizing this. Um, I had read a really uh, important piece he did in Counterpunch a few months ago, and so I said, I emailed him immediately and said, yeah, we, sh we should get together, and where are you these days? I'll be in Paris in the spring. And we overlap, I think, five days. So yeah. he put this uh, seminar together uh, and invited me. And so I'm really grateful to have this chance to meet you all to talk. And I think, again, as, as Gabriel said, we'll both speak for 15 minutes or so. And then the really exciting and interesting part will be our, our conversation afterwards. So um, let's stay. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to that. So I just have about five or six small points to make. And they may not touch everything that Gabriel mentioned. And that will, that will happen during our Q&A. But one thing uh, that, that Gabriel, Gabriel gave me to read was his essay about violence and the way uh, that... Co-authored co piece. Co-authored so piece. I'm not the violence. only author. Okay. Um, and how that has been one of the primary ways that the press has basically attacked anti-fascist work in the United States. It's, it's violent. And so somehow that's an automatic disqualifier. And... Um, so I thought I'd speak a little bit about violence to begin with. And you know, the, the famous quotation from Stokely Carmichael, there's nothing more American. You know, it's, violence is as American as apple pie. And when you think of violence, um, one thing that we might begin with since we're here in France is that, does anybody know this? It's a very famous speech that Ernest Renan gave at the Sorbonne called What is a Nation? A few of you know. It's, 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 a, it's a great essay, uh, it's a great talk, 1882. And the, the important thing to bring forward for that, uh, for our discussion today, is that he says that every single nation state that's been founded has been founded on violence, period. I mean, just straight out. And the worst threat that any national history has to it is historical accuracy. In other words, historical accuracy, the correct historical record, will always bring out that fact of violence. And so he said the worst threat is historical accuracy, and the best aid to na nation building is amnesia. So the United States has a very good uh, tradition of amnesia, and it's now instantiated in the public education system. It's been a way of continually replenishing our stockpile of amnesia, and to forget not just the wars of extermination in terms of indigenous people, but every war up to today, and including the, the Cold Wars as well, has had an element of violence and coercion, uh, either diplomatically or militarily. Um, Henry Giroux, who has been you know, one of my mentors and who got me to, into blocking with Truth Out, really has a great series of, series of books about uh, the violence in America, in particular violence against young people, and the way that's been instrumentalized and naturalized and if you think about, in particular, the United States as being uh, just things like mass media, you know, the fact that sex is so absolutely censored 
you know. And yet violence is, is promoted, and the more violence, the better. So what kind of message does this send about human relationships, you know, the, the, of pleasure and love versus bloodshed and killing? Uh, so I think this is something that we have to think about as embedded within our culture. It's not just something that uh, occurs sporadically, but it's, it's sort of there under the surface and 24-7. And uh, there's a very good uh, book by Rob Nixon called Slow Violence, The Environmentalism of the Poor. And I'd like to think of his concept of slow violence, which he's really talking about in the environment, uh, and how so much of the environmental violence that goes on is unmappable because it takes pace at such a, uh, it takes place at such a slow pace. Right? U uranium poisoning, for example, climate change. All these things are not violent in the sense of an explosive uh, instance, but they fly underneath our radar, yet they are there and they build and they become part of the landscape without us even noticing it. And the same thing with violence, I think. Uh, there's an undercurrent of violence that's there ready to be tapped into and is very explosive. And so that, that too escapes our notice, but we, we notice when there's anti fa violence and we are quick to, to amplify that a lot. Um, uh, there's also the violence of hidden narratives like um, uh, the, the narrative around um, what the United States is doing with regard to Israel and has done since the founding of the State of Israel and the way in which uh, we have just signed a $38 billion military aid package with Israel, which is the largest military aid package in history. Um, so what about the way that we're facilitating violence and that many of the bullets that have struck uh, medics, reporters, and children in Gaza are, are you know, have our, our, our imprimatur on it. Uh, you all know Fr Franz Fanon's very famous uh, pronouncement that in some senses, in some cases, violence is the most rational thing in the world, right? When, when, when you're faced with violence, are we supposed to then fall back on nonviolence? No, that would be, that would be a, a pathologically insane thing to do. But the question then becomes, whose arguments for the legitimacy of violence are heard and which ones are discredited. Right? In other words, what's the narrative that embeds uh, the justification of violence versus non? Um, there was this very interesting um, thing at Oxford called the Oxford Union, uh, uh, which has been around for ages. And they had these very interesting debates. And there was one very um, germane piece where uh, Angela Davis and Cornell West were arguing, uh, is violence a legitimate instrument for freedom? So I encourage you to watch that all on YouTube. Because, uh, pardon me? Um, it's called the Oxford Union Debate, and you just put that into the YouTube and put in Angela Davis and Cornell West. Um, I think the, the, the given was uh, resolved um, violence is legitimate in the cause of freedom. So these are, these are things that we are used to not thinking about, right? because the case has been settled for us in advance. Um, and that's one of the things that has been um, at the forefront of the disarming of anti-fascist work. Um, it seems a no-brainer to think that being an anti-fascist would be good because my generation, all of, all of the people of my generation had fathers and uncles who fought in the Second World War. We were fighting fascism, we were fighting dictators. This was a bad thing, fascism. And now when people say, how can you be anti-fascist? I say, well, how can I not be? And if you're anti-anti-fascist, you're a fascist. I mean, if, if you just follow the linguistic breadcrumbs, you get to that conclusion. And then they say, yeah, well, no, I'm not. But, but this is the way that our thinking has been poisoned, that a response to fascist violence should be counter-violence. I mean, it would be irrational not to. And yet, the press has been very, you know, as usual, very uh, clever in framing stories in a certain way. So when you look at what happened at Berkeley in, in the, the latest fracas, and I was there, and I saw fascists and anti-fascists beating each other, and I saw 
a narrative that didn't appear on the news, which was that they would just cut to the moment where an Antifa person would club a fascist and say, you see, there's that. But they didn't see everything leading up to it, which was the fascist had pepper spray and it just sprayed the Antifa activist. So all of that stuff is clipped and becomes a burden for liberals. Right? What are they going to do? They, they know that fascism, fascism is bad, but these Antifa people, they're just out of control. And so you have people like Chris Hedges who, you know, I take my hat off to him in all sorts of ways, but his article was just obnoxious in that, you know, it's the matter of what tactics are acceptable to liberals, right? In other words, uh, if that's the litmus test that any kind of anti-fascist work has to pass, then good luck, right? Because it's almost a matter of aesthetics and taste. You know, it's distasteful <coughs> to wear black, and it's distasteful to, to be aggressive and all these things. And how can you do that without alienating the left? And, you know, the re response should be, why should we have to appease them? I mean, in other words, what's the cost-benefit? Because once you start subscribing to that notion of appeasement and litmus test making, um, the stakes can always be changed. It's a movable game in which they can always say, well, no, don't do this, don't do that. So you can't, you can't start down that, that slope. So one of the things that I'd like to talk about today is the fact that we have to rehabilitate the notion of anti-fascism uh, and see that there are appropriate responses to fascism and that fascism today is going underground. Uh, if you think of what's happening here in France, for example, uh, and in Europe in general, the right wing has really decided to cleanse itself of, of things like being anti-Semitic. Right? And, so, and they, they do that as a way to move people um, move toward the, the middle ground. And similar things are happening in the United States. So the fascists are, are being less um, out there. We all know that Milos was caught in the Starbucks and chased down the street. We all know that Richard Spencer says, well, Antifa is one because it's no fun anymore. Um, and so they're going underground. And I think that it's important for us now to start thinking about ways in which they're insinuating themselves in a much softer, kinder kind of way into the fabric of American life. And one of the first ways of doing it is to trying to continually um, brand Antifa as terrorist. And I'll just end with, with a, a personal story, which was that um, you know, a lot of my you know, colleagues and allies had been you know, taken to task and, and harassed for saying one thing or another. And Recently at, at Stanford, um, I was approached by the right-wing newspaper called the Stanford Review. It was founded in 1987 by Peter Thiel, who was very upset about the culture wars way back then, and he continues to meet with the editors. That's a whole other story. They reached out to me and they said, you know, you founded this campus anti-fascist network. Um, we'd like to interview you. And the previous article that they had done on me was entitled, um, Stanford's most radical professor. Oh, meet Stanford's most radical professor. And my wife and I went to Berkeley, and I, I read that to her, and she just laughs. Like, and I said, you know, you know it, it demeans Stanford more than it demeans me to call me the Stanford's most radical professor. And yet they never interviewed me for it. They just smeared me about my work on BDS. So I thought this time I would give them the benefit of the doubt and also go on record by speaking with them. Not speaking with them, but emailing, because I wanted everything in writing. So I had this back and forth, and they kept on saying, well, do you believe in violence? Do you believe in violence? And I kept on saying, we believe in this, this, and this, and it's very clear, all our public statements, fine. It was a very cordial, I thought, exchange, email exchange. Then she sends me the link. The title of this essay is, or article is, um, Campus, oh no, sorry, An Antifa thugs find a leader in David Palumbo Leo. <laughs> right? And this is just ridiculous, because, uh, and in, in any case, Fox News picks up on this, Jihad Watch puts, picks up on this, Breitbart picks up on this. Um, I start getting all these threats. They go on Fox and Friends. And I was hoping Donald Trump would tweet on it, because he won, but no, that, he was doing the State of the Union. I was so cheated out of my moment. 
<laughs> anyway, it, they do a segment. You can, you can look. It starts, it starts off hilariously in that I'm not there, but they have this really nice picture of me in like a suit and a tie. I just look like a broker. And, 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 and it begins, and so David Palumbalu has started a Stanford club. And I thought, oh my God, no, it's not a glee club. Or anything. <laughs> the, the facts were, had long left the room before this thing aired. Um, it got to be so bad that six law professors at Stanford Law School, each of them constitutional experts, and occupying the political spectrum from the right to the left, uh, the colleague who put this together was very shrewd, wrote an open letter saying, we've, looked, we've scoured the public record, nothing that David, well, we don't agree with everything he says, nothing that he said or done is, would come close to anything of these charges. That did not stop the Stanford Review from continually, in fact, they started a fundraising campaign using this Fox and Friends thing as, as their thing. So I finally went to my administration, I think this will sort of wrap up, and I said, um, so what are you going to do about this? You know, it's proven that this is, I, it's not as if I had done something, I was being called on it, which I would be happy to, to take responsibility for. I said and did nothing. And they said, yes, but, you know, we really can't, we can't, you know, it would hurt, it would hurt students. This, I mean, they came up with all sorts of bullshit. It was just, it was unbelievable. So finally I wrote an article for The Guardian saying, you know, I don't have enough money to bring a libel suit. Uh, and the other reason I can't bring a libel suit was that, it, and this is for all of you who ever tempted to um, sue somebody, if you're an activist, don't do a libel suit because in the process of discovery that will get through all your emails and all of your activist friends will then have their emails deposed. So I said, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, so I'm still, by the public record, if you go through Fox and Friends, I am the leader of a terrorist organization. The best the university did is they, gave, they said they would, they would give you some security for a couple of days. So that's the state of things these days. Um, I think I'll end there. Okay, thanks. So I'll, I'll pick up on a few of the threads uh, from uh, David's presentation because I really want to highlight two things. One uh, overlaps with some of the discussions that we've already had, at least briefly, and that is a kind of counter history of fascism and just understanding how it emerged historically because I think that if we understand that, we might be able to come to terms better with how to struggle against it today. And then secondly, look at some of the major kind of buzzwords in the contemporary debate around fascism, things like free speech, violence, et cetera, which will segue with what David was saying. And uh, I really like the expression that you used of a stockpile of amnesia and the ways in which the mass education system tends to operate is one of stockpiling consciousness with amnesia. And one way of understanding a very brief counterhistory of fascism that I'll outline is it's struggling back against that stockpile of amnesia. Uh, fascism, as it's often understood in contemporary discourse, at least from a liberal perspective, by which I mean, of course, defenders of political liberalism, not liberals versus conservatives, is it's a kind of moral position where there are these horrific individuals who say really bad things and should be condemned, and there's a kind of individualization of fascism, often at the expense then of systemic analysis of its modes of organization and emergence. And usually from the liberal perspective then, what's claimed is that even if these individuals are abhorrent, we should nonetheless tolerate them because they have a platform as well as anyone else because we live within liberal democracies in which everyone has the right to free speech, etc. Now, if you actually look at the material history of fascism as it emerged, there are a number of important factors to be aware of. One is that it emerged within liberal democracies, not in strict opposition to them. In the case of fascism, strictly speaking, within uh, Italy and Mussolini's black shirts, there was a development that worked first and foremost through the party system. Um, there were important moments at which they broke with the kind of apparatus or system of uh, liberal rule. They were also funded by MI5, so they had support from the British Secret Service. 
And that this was the model then for the Nazi rise of power and how did the Nazis come to power. They didn't come to power by some dictatorial seizure of state power. They came to power through elections. Right? In both cases, at the very end of that process, there's a very quick shift in the constitutional state. So the constitutional state is used as a means. Once enough power is uh, obtained, then that's shifted, and very quickly then the liberal state or certain aspects of it are dismantled. What this means is historically, liberalism is not a bulwark against fascism. Liberalism is the seedbed of fascism. And we see this perhaps most clearly in relationship to the dominant ideological trope concerning the United States and the kind of contemporary history of the world. The United States and their Western allies were not opposed to fascism. They were working with, selling arms to, selling tanks, or selling uh, engines for tanks to the Nazis and, to, um, and working with Mussolini. Alan Dulles, the uh, founding, uh, one of the founding directors of the CIA, of course, famously said during World War II, we're fighting the wrong enemy. And what he meant by that is that we're fighting the, com we're fighting the uh, Nazis when we should be fighting the communists, and went about orchestrating behind the scenes an attempted pact with Hitler Germany in order to exit the alliance with Soviet communism and thereby take the Nazi party in the direction of an alliance with, uh, with the United States. And this is not just some bizarre moment in history. Uh, Alan Dulles had a whole series of meetings with top Nazi officials. And then after the Second World War, the CIA, the OSS, which is the predecessor organization of the CIA, um, through the work of Alan Dulles and many others, then established the major rat lines for the Nazis and the fascists, leading them often through the work of uh, the Vatican to Latin America. And uh, at least uh, there's the numbers vary on this. There were 1,600 Nazi scientists who were brought directly into the United States through Operation Paperclip, many of whom were given academic jobs. And there were approximately, you know, around 10,000, the numbers vary, it's hard to know for certain, other Nazis who were brought directly into the United States. Uh, as well as direct pushback against the Nuremberg trials in order to make sure that Nazi officials who worked very, very high and were very close with Hitler were either distributed through the rat lines or uh, brought into the U.S. And then they, one of the most remarkable stories is the history of the German Secret Service which was a Nazi official in, in charge of the Eastern Front under the Nazis. He was brought into the US, trained by the CIA, and then put back in charge of the German Secret Service in the post-war era. So the idea that the liberal, so-called liberal democracy of the United States waged war on fascism in order to save the world from the kind of cataclysmic nature of what Hitler and Mussolini were doing, uh, is not tenable at a historical and, and material level. And of course, I'm going very, very quick here, but there's probably 100 books that I could point you to, and documents from the CIA and from the US administration itself, as well as firsthand testimonies. Right? Many of these figures are actually proud of what they did, because who fights communists better than fascists? That was the MO of the entire beginning of the Cold War. That's why they were recruited and set back up within Germany. That's why they were recruited and set back up within Italy. Uh, we needed to fight communism at all costs because of communists are anti-capitalist. Um, right? In fact, there's a great quote um, uh, by Alan Dulles where he says, well, the Nazis are pro-capitalist Aryan Christians, whereas the true enemy was the godless communism and its resolute anti-capitalism. Right? That kind of sets the tenor. Alan Dulles is probably the single most important political figure of the 20th century, given the power that he had uh, over the entire US administration and their imperial endeavors in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, so he's not a small potato. Uh, combined with that, if we look at the history of US politics since World War II, there has been meddling and interference in over 80 foreign elections. Uh, overthrowing of 50 foreign governments, the majority of whom were democratically elected, dropping bombs on 30 countries. So anyone who flat-footedly asserts that the United States is a liberal democracy that's protecting us against fascism doesn't understand very fundamental elements of the recent history of uh, the United States. And of course, a lot of this is due to the stockpile of amnesia, because what I'm saying probably sounds a little bit surprising, 
but it shouldn't when you actually think about it. If we had educational systems that focused on the material history of political bodies like the United States, then this would all be common knowledge and we wouldn't even have to have this conversation. Um, instead, of course, we have history books that completely allied these topics or uh, eradicate these elements from, from history. So all of this leads me to raise a question that I would like for all of us to uh, discuss, think about, um, and try to unpack. And that is, if liberalism and fascism historically are not opposites, is there a way of understanding them actually as modes of governance that might have a fundamental compatibility? A compatibility in the sense that uh, liberalism functions in harmony with the history of global capitalism, that's how it emerged as a political system, and that we might want to understand fascism as a mode of governance for capitalism under threat. Uh, meaning, it's a mode of governance that is deployed at times at which people push back against the capitalist system, or, uh, and this might be pushed back in, in the sense of immediate direct resistance, or it might just be spontaneous pushback because your life is so destroyed that there's no other option but to try to resist it in some way, shape, or form, because the fascist mode of governance tends to be used on the poor underclasses and subalterns of the world. Right? Uh, in this sense, then, if we try to understand it in this way, then we'd have to look at how the very idea that there's a central government that is structured in such a way that we could label it as a democracy, right? This is one of the debates today is, is the democracy of the United States being stolen by fascists or disappearing or something like this. I think that what we actually have to understand is that the way in which modes of governance operate is there might just be different levels of nested governmentality in which the prison industrial complex as it operates within the United States, you'd be hard pressed to describe it as anything other than fascist. It's a fascism orchestrated against targeted populations which are largely poor populations of color. Right? The work of ICE, uh, the fact that over a thousand individuals, all of them poor, uh, many of them demographically uh, Native American, black, brown, etc., Latino, uh, the fact that over a thousand are killed by the police every year and this, that this surpasses statistically many of the years of the lynching campaigns in the South uh, would suggest that, well, the way in which policing operates in the United States is also a fascistic mode of governance for the poor and for anyone who pushes back against it. Right? In this regard then, and I just want to keep an eye on time because I don't want to go on too long, I would uh, want to, I'll just add a few more things for us to think about and that is that if it's indeed the case that there's not an oppositional structure uh, uh, between liberalism and fascism, but instead the possibility that they would operate as harmonious, but um, kind of, uh, how to put it, they are, would be modes of governance intention, a bit like the good cop and the bad cop. Right? The good cop of liberalism says you have all your rights, the bad cop of fascism comes in as soon as you exercise such of those rights in such a substantive way that they actually put the system under threat. Right? The history of the uh, evacuation of the occupied sites is a great example. We all have the freedom to peaceably assemble until it goes on too long and the state decides through Homeland Security that they want to get these you know, dirty leftists out of the way and then they do it. Um, if, if we understand it in these terms, then I think that we also have to rethink the conceptual pillars of liberalism that tend to dominate the mass media debate on our understanding of fascism. So I'll be very quick in this regard, but I'd love to return to some of these. Free speech is one of the major pillars. David's piece is excellent on this, and I also have a, a piece on this, so I won't say a lot, except for that one of the things that free speech avoids is the question of power. Right? The fact that you would have formal rights to something shouldn't do anyone. What really matters is if you have the substantive right to the power of having your voice broadcast and heard. That's why a whole series of figures have been invited to university campuses is because they have the right to speak. They can do their crazy neogenesis speech on a soapbox on the corner, at least according to the kind of framework of a liberal, quote unquote liberal democracy. They don't have the right to a university megaphone. Right? So the question is about power, not about speech. Secondly, the issue of violence, and here I, I, I very strongly agree with uh, what David was saying, there's a kind of aesthetics of violence that we really have to be attentive to. Uh, 
That is that the violence that is visible is the infinitesimal violence of those whose descent is being denigrated by the status quo. It is the tiny grains of sand that certain people put in the massive machinery that is the corporatocracy and global capitalism. What is rendered invisible in this aesthetics of violence is that system itself. Right? So the fact that a few Antifa people would you know, punch a Nazi or break a few windows is over-escalated as violence per se, whereas the state apparatus and everything that it does, which Martin Luther King, of course, famously pointed out that the U.S. is the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, and of course the statement is of d'actuality, as you say, it's a very contemporary statement, means that this aesthetics of violence, it basically it inverts things. It's like a dialectic of sorts, right? The most violent forms imaginable are rendered invisible, and the most infinitesimal forms of quote-unquote violence are given uh, full-fledged force as if they were just violence uh, incarnate. This overlaps with the issue of direct action, um, because I think a lot of the grains of sand that you see, they're direct actions. And when you perceive direct action as a form of violence, it's precisely because you are disturbed by the grains of sand and you don't see the system, meaning the whole well-oiled machinery and the cogs that those grains of sand are falling into. And it's that machinery that is much more violent. In other words, we should think about indirect action. People are angry that there's some direct action against you know, these uh, uh, figures that, that David was, was referring to, but what about the indirect action of an entire military, industrial, academic complex that is favoring particular worldviews, practices, doing research and analysis for the military, etc. That is rendered largely invisible. Right? A fourth point to this is the status of the university and the liberal discourse on the university being an ivory tower. If you know anything about the history of universities, their roots are in the most sordid and dark aspects of the history of, of imperialism. Right? You, universities uh, taught scientific racism uh, for years and years and years, uh, and arguably in certain cases still do, or at least justify certain approaches to them, um, like in the work of Charles Murray, who's regularly invited, or was at least, to, to various universities. And that presupposes a kind of separation of spheres that I think we have to be radically uh, critical of. And the last thing that I'll say is the role of nationalism in obfuscating the extent to which there are multiple modes of governance that are often operative within a single nation state. So people would say, oh no, as an American I have rights, or as a French person I live in the French Republic, when in fact that's true for certain sectors of the population, but by no means for all sectors of the population. And look at foreign policy if you want to know what your government's actually doing and try to understand it instead of just you know, siphoning off or, or, or being weaned on the, um, the stockpile of of amnesia. So I'll, I'll leave it there just to get the kind of conversation rolling. And I think there's a lot on the table. I don't know if, David, you want to react immediately or we can open it up right away if people want to jump in. Well, just one short thing, uh, because I think your mentioning of, you know, anti-communism is, is really, really key here. And I was thinking that, you know, in the same building several weeks ago, there was a Global 68 um, conference. It was a very good one in, in many respects. But in one respect, there was a, a missing voice, and you talked about missing voices, because so much of 1968 globally was about the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. And they had South Asian experts, but no Vietnamese. It was like that voice was you know, resoundingly absent. And one of the things that, that, that was always put forward um, by those of us in the anti-war movement uh, came back to us through a very strange conduit, which was Robert McNamara, who was the Secretary of Defense during the whole thing. And he wrote this astounding book about maybe 10 years ago or so, in which he says, in, in the most bizarre way possible, um, the problem with you know, why we didn't win the war was because we didn't have enough empathy. He actually yeah, says, more we, we, we didn't have enough empathy. We couldn't, we couldn't see what they were thinking. And you know, for those of us in the anti-war movement, we, we were making that argument for ages. He was said, you know, I fi I, we finally had to realize that it wasn't a war against, they didn't think of it as a war against communism, between capitalism and communism. They thought of it as a civil war, which is exactly what it was. It was a, it was a democratically elected government 
was deposed by the, by the United States. And, you know, so the Vietnamese were pl- putting their lives on the line, uh, not because they were anti-communist, it was because they were anti-imperialist. And that was, the, and they were pro-democratic. So that, that's the kind of, of, of historical, not even amnesia, it's just a, a, a blindness to what other people's struggles are about and the overlaying of this Cold War um, uh, narrative upon, you know, the whole idea of the spread of democracy is recycling these pernicious myths of, of you know, communism that uh, also work to foster uh, fascism. And the only other thing I would say is that, you know, going back to one of the things I said, I'd like to, to sort of bring it forward for this. What kind of violence do we find acceptable? In other words, and why do we? I think that's one of the key questions that we have to raise. And I think Gabriel is right in saying that, you know, our understand, my understanding of fascism is the, is the collaboration between the state and business interests. And there's all sorts of economic violence that we just sign on to, you know, whether it's wage theft or any number of other things uh, that are, again, as, as Gabriel said, grains of sand, and they become part of this sort of underlying um, structure of life that we've become acclimatized to, so much so that we don't understand the violence that's being perpetrated upon uh, us and our, our, our loved ones all the time. Okay, that's all I'll say. Katie, you want to jump in? Yeah, um, thank you so much both for this. Um, I thought this was really helpful um, in terms of finding ways to trace sort of the, the slipperiness of the term violence as this tonal shift that has policy backing um, and sort of structural power behind it. Um, and David, I wanted to sort of put some pressure on a word that you used mm-hmm. and then you know, see whether you stand by it mm-hmm. um, or what it means. Uh, but you said that we need to figure out how to make violence um, an appropriate response to fascism. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking now about sort of like, you know, adjacent um, earlier environmental terrorism, um, like crackdowns in the U.S. um, and things like the Shack 7 and other sorts of legal legal manipulations that used the term terror, um, Mm -hmm. which is a racialized term, you know, which is why we have private prisons across the United States that we disappear brown bodies into all the time. Um, but that word being something that a make, that could make um, making a website that costs corporate profit into a terrorist act, or make something you know mm-hmm. like um, what you were you know, you know thanks for thanks for heading that terrorist group. Um, yeah. Like let me know if I can join. But um, you know, so I'm sort of I'm, I'm curious about what making violence appropriate or what making violence an appropriate response to fascism actually mm-hmm. entails. Mm-hmm. And I'm curious about, I mean, because obviously it's not, I mean, listening to this discussion is like an exercise in realizing that the idea of like tit for tat, right, you know, to respond to massive state violence, you know, or, you know, granular, sort of smaller, not granular, um, the sort of smaller, diffuse, but massively powerful structural violence that the state operates through um, is, you know, I mean, that, that, that to equate, to respond, with like an, an equal type of violence is by mm-hmm. definition inappropriate. Mm-hmm. Um, is 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 itself you know to, to make a, a power a state of domination into a power dynamic is is inappropriate, yeah. right? It's like definitionally inappropriate, you know. Mm-hmm. And so what's is, you know what what actually happens, you know when when like how I guess maybe this is a you know, broader question, but how do you what is, what is at stake in your vision of shifting the aesthetics of the word violence? Yeah, I, that's a really good question. I can, I can try to answer it in a number of ways, and some of it echoes what Gabriel said, which is that, um, to begin with, the idea that um, we could ever respond with commensurate violence to state violence is mm-hmm. impossible. In other words, I mean, it, it, the world wouldn't exist as it does if that was conceivable, right? What Gabriel was talking about too. The power, I mean, and the power is not just, I don't want to locate in the White House or on Wall Street, but I also want to think about this idea of how we are interpolated into uh, being complicit with this. And you mentioned terror, and, and one of the really interesting notions of, of terrorism is that um, one of the first modern instantiations of terror was the um, was in Guernica with the bombing of, of Guernica by the Luftwaffe, which had become 
partners with the Spanish uh, fascists. And that was beginning of the notion of psychological warfare, which was that it was, it now would be conceived of as, as a, a, a violation of, it would be a crime against humanity because what you're doing is you're turning civilians into militants, right? Because their terror becomes contagious and all of a sudden, ordinary citizens are militarized through this extreme act of violence. So I think that we have to understand how we have become terrorized and we become links in the chain of terrorism when we, in, in a very dis, in a discreet way, simply go along with things, right? We, we, we accept the decision that this is unacceptable violence and any reaction to it that, that, that smacks of it in any way at all is, is, is uh, illegitimate. Uh, one of the two books I'm working on now is going to be on something. I published this essay a while ago about a debt and um, I came up with this notion of counter-morality because there's so much moralism going on. For example, the idea that those that are now deprived of pensions should play along with austerity because, after all, we're all in the same boat together, which is blatantly not true, right? It was the idea that the public was, the private debt was now becoming converted to public debt and it was the, those most vulnerable that were going to have to pay for the excesses and, and frivolity and recklessness of, of um, insurance and real estate um, um, interest, right? So we, I, I would like us to rethink the automatic reactions that we have to uh, these moralistic terms to realize that their genesis uh, in almost a Nietzschean way and understand that um, we need to be responsible for uh, critiquing them. Right? rather than simply going along with it in, in the way that we've been conditioned, that nobody likes violence, but some people don't have any choice. Right? I mean, there's a thing, this concept called moral luck. Have you, do you know this, this idea of moral luck? Which is that you can make all these moral judgments very easily if, you, if the chances of you being put in a decision-making position are remote. Right? If you've never been colonized, then you can make all sorts of very easy moral pronouncements. Right? But what if you're in Gaza? What if, what if the way that the press is portraying this border uh, isn't, isn't, doesn't disclose the fact that it's an illegal fence? This is not the state of Israel. This is occupied territory. They just want to go home. It's, it's their natural, it's their internationally agreed upon right to return to their homes from, from territories that have been um, seized from them through an act of war, which is illegal. So we have to understand that what seems to be, and this is, I, I'm sorry I'm going off to the Palestine thing, but this notion that the Palestinians are simply tools of Hamas is ridiculous. You know, or that the fact that 50 Hamas uh, members were, were found amongst the dead, therefore, but not all members of Hamas are terrorists. But, but we've been conditioned to think that power and, and, and resistance and violence in the hands of some people is totally illegitimate, whereas it's a natural endowment of others to, to exercise violence. Um, yeah. Can I jump in on this too? Because it's a Please, really yeah. interesting series yeah. of questions. One is just on the, the category of the terrorist, I do think it's very important to highlight that this is one of the dominant floating signifiers of our day, and that a terrorist is used basically to delegitimate any political practice <coughs> that is orchestrated against the powers that be. Um, so the whole adage of you know one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter, I think is a really, really important It's the only point. thing that Ronald Reagan ever said that I agreed with. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that he said it. Yeah, that was it. Well, I don't know if he said it, but he, he perpetuated that. Right. right. The other thing that I would say is that in regarding the question of violence is that I do think it's important to raise the following question. If violence didn't work as a tactic or as a strategy, why has it been used so widely and so successfully by the history of imperial capitalism. Um, and moreover, I would add to that that this aesthetics of violence that I was talking about, where the vi basically it's counter, it's the violence is visible in resistance, but not uh, the violence of the state apparatus. So Israel versus, for instance, you know, a few firecrackers basically thrown yeah. by, the, um, by the Palestinians, goes hand in hand with a moralization of the violence of resistance, 
uh, there's a great quote by James Baldwin where he says, the only time nonviolence is praised is, is when it's for the Negroes. Okay? Not talking about nonviolence of the U.S. state. Mm -hmm. We're talking about it only in the case when it's moralized from the point of view of those who are resisting that violence. I think you want to jump in. Pierre, right? Yeah. If I say anybody's um, name wrong, correct me. Yeah. So I'm very sympathetic to this sort of understanding of liberalism and fascism as sort of tendencies of governance, where fascism sort of reinstills the founding violence that uh, was sort of, that is then covered up again by liberalism. However, I'd like to sort of complexify the picture a bit when it comes to the differences in debate between, for instance, the US and Europe, because um, the monopoly of violence in, in the US is sort of uh, different in the sense that, um, well, there's a right to bear arms that is sort of still very prominent and so many liberal responses go sort of against this right to bear arms. And I think this renders sort of the discourse on violence ever more uh, difficult in the US and I'm just pondering what role it plays in, in hindering the, the emergence of a concept of violence that is more productive, right? Um, so then, obviously, by the right, there's some sort of appropriation of a sort of discourse of, of softness that emerged in queer theory, and that is being read, for instance, by the German right wing, uh, heavily read and heavily appropriated in the sense that the words get coded. Um, and I think this is sort of a downside of the liberal version of identity politics uh, that gets used as a propaganda strategy. And, um, then, uh, regarding the university, there's, in some sense, the moralism is just an effect of the aversion to an understanding of society as, as structured, or the notion of structure here plays sort of, I think, a key role in the sense that, for instance, structuralism is completely, well, very often misread in, in the in U.S. academy, um, or social sciences have disavowed any understanding of structures, and moralism sort of brings it down to the responsible individual and um, I think if we want to arrive at, at a relational notion of violence that is perhaps more descriptive than um, moralistic, we have to take this into account and sort of think of, well, relational uh, um, concepts or relational models to, to think violence. And one of these models, obviously, that's emerging a bit is sort of the, uh, well, flat ontologies that come across that we come across in the new materialism discourse but they're not very well conceptualized in my opinion so that would be something to in some sense engage with in the sense that somehow this flat ontology discourse manages to sort of wave its way through the academy Bruno Latour was very prominent although Bruno Latour does not see a difference between the left or the right right the problems we face are global there's no left no right uh, I disagree completely and I think his take on critique is also uh, well pretty much to, to throw in, in, the, in the dustbin but um, that is a position we have to take seriously if we want to work with it conceptually because there is some good concepts there that we can use the question would be just how do we strategize with uh, these emergent concepts and how do we work with it and how do we take into account the complexities of the systems in their various nation-state incarnation because in Germany for instance the whole narrative of, of well anti-fascism is that in some sense there was an hour zero after uh, well after World War II and somehow then uh, did, there was no continuity in governmentality between fascism and uh, well the German Republic, which is completely false, completely right? False, um, yeah. So um, there, the notion of the states is still sort of the strongest uh, component against fascism and is being used even by the German left in it, well, in the liberal political sphere, obviously, but um, so just want to sort of complexify the picture. Those are all really great uh, comments, questions, and themes to explore. I couldn't agree more with the need to move away from an understanding of violence that would be dependent upon a substantialist ontology and presuppose that violence is a thing that you're going to meet or a thing that you could define once and for all with one common property. Violence needs to be understood relationally. And with a relational understanding of violence, what that means is that you cannot simply say that one type of violence is akin to or analogous to another type of violence. The violence is a power relation 
that always then needs to be understood in its precise material configuration, right? And so you can think of people like uh, Franz Fanon uh, claiming quite famously, of course, that the anti-colonial violence, which would never have been required if colonization hadn't happened in the first place, is just the boomerang effect to a certain extent of the colonizers. So you can't divorce it from this relational dynamic. Therefore, it's of, it is of a different um, status, if you will, and I think that's crucially important. I don't think, I agree with your criticisms of Bruno Latour, and, um, but I also think that he's by no means the only one who has done interesting work on relationality, relational ontologies, etc. Um, and could list a bunch of other names, but it's probably, probably not necessary. On the other that's issues... Great. What's that? If you list the other names that I'm well, I'm thinking of, I mean, uh, uh, relational ontologies or relational modes of thinking, I think really is at the core of the structuralist project going back to the early 20th century. And so structuralist linguistics, particularly as it's conceived of in the work of Saussure and following out of Saussure through, obviously, the work of Derrida and other kind of more contemporary thinkers, are trying to understand systems of signification in which there aren't simple substances or words that would have definitive definitions, but instead there's a system of relations, right? All that we have is the differential relations between signifiers. Um, and so there's a lot of other, and there's a lot of other structuralists who kind of work in this, in this vein. Yeah. Um, in um, Adult Power and Violence, Stephen Luke uh, gives yeah. yeah. us a, a good map about uh, power as domination, power as ontology, yeah. and he works with the uh, relational ontology. Yeah. I no, I think that it's a, yeah. What a lot of other thinkers that maybe could be useful. Yeah. Did you have a resource on this? Because I don't want to uh, avoid his other questions, which were really oh, great. Yeah, no, just Legit, I'm just going to try to be as quick as possible because you packed a lot in. I would say that I agree really with the moralism versus structures. If I understand by structure something like material systems of power then we need to have an account for them rather than the, the moralism. I couldn't agree more. And the, the claim regarding identity politics, I think, should also be part of the conversation because one of the interesting things that we've seen as of late, I mean, there are predecessors to this, but it's become very visible as of late, is given a certain formalism and liberalism to particular types of identity politics, they not only are made for recuperation by the right, they are easily integrated within white nationalist discourses and, and have been. And so it should give us not only pause to kind of think about identity politics, but then also raise larger issues of different ways of dealing with the histories of racialization, of uh, gendered bodies, etc., that might not follow the line of liberal style identity politics. The very first point I didn't fully understand about the right to bear arms. No, it's just a difference of, of context. Uh, it was more of a question, in some sense, how does how does that function as an obstacle? Because it seems to me that it does play a role in, in the debate, in the sense that the state monopoly of violence is sort of more formal, but then distributed across the population that bears arms. And if we look at the mm. statistics, it's oh, obviously most arms are in the South, most arms are owned by white men. So um, Right. But I would say the monopoly of violence is still maintained by the state, because since if you buy an arm and then you kill a fascist, uh, the state is going to come after yeah. you for that. Um, and, but if you kill an anti-fascist, you're okay. Yeah. So we should know from recent history if you are not aware of it. So I, I see that it complexifies yeah. it in the, the sense that... The question was more what, how in some sense can, can the discourse, for instance, against uh, the right to bear arms, for instance, with the school shootings or, yeah. um, well, other shootings that occur be in some sense uh, uh, used um, in, in a good way for a left that wants to perhaps question that very state monopoly. Well, the, the right to bear arms, <coughs> the phrase that follows is, well, the phrase that precedes it is, given the fact that a state militia is necessary, blah, blah. So it wasn't just individuals. It was meant precisely to be sort of, in a sense, anti-centralized government so that state militias could, if there was an oppressive central government, could do that. But yeah, it's very slippery in that way. Um, I know there's a bunch of other people. Maybe I'll take stack. Yeah, we'll start with Brandon and Timur for sure. Uh, give me a sign if you want me to write your name down. Um, <laughs> so I'll start with a response to the right to bear arms. Um, it's in the, U in the U.S. at least it's deployed very unevenly. Um, historically, the NRA supported gun control uh, against the Black Panthers, and we see today that. Um, many 
the way it's raised as many white people as the middle class white people can have as many guns as they want to use them in sorted ways, such as school shootings, but anything resembling gun to me, um, brown bodies or brown individuals are shot on sight by the police. Um, and then I guess I have a historical comment and a theoretical question if we have to. Well, go ahead, you've got the floor. Um, I guess um, a very early instance of successful anti-fascist action that has a lot of interesting parallels to the student activism and Antifa in Berkeley is the Battle of Cable Street in, I think, 34 in East London. And the response to the press was very, and the police as well, was very interesting because uh, the police protected Oswald Mosley, who was very much kind of a posh, charismatic figure like Richard Spencer or whatever. And he and his cohorts were protected by the police marching into a Jewish neighborhood who grew and the inhabitants of the neighborhood as well as various communists and trade unionists and other socialists um, were depicted very poorly by the press, um, but nevertheless they were successful in keeping the fascists out and who, with, by marching into this neighborhood, kind of brought a signifier of violence to come if they were not pushed away. And I guess going off that um, theoretical question or comment, and I'd be very interested to hear both your responses. So, um, your, both your articles prompted me to look at Benjamin's critique of violence again, and he um, looked and he characterized violence <coughs> as a material. Two ways of constituting, of uh, thinking of material are things are either constituted or made of materials, or materials are made into instruments. Um, so counterviolence seems a lot like an instrument, whereas fascism and to some extent liberalism, although a lot of the violence is monopolized and hidden away, is very much constituted of violence as if it were material. So um, what do you, both of you think of that? Do you want to start? Um, I don't know that essay well. So, um, and sort of gets back to what you were saying about structuralism. I'm sort of, after going through structuralism, I'm a little, I'm a little <laughs> averse to binaries, right? Because I'm, I'm not quite sure what the system is in which they are embedded, so I'll have to pass on that. Okay. I don't know if I, I'll think about it. Yeah. I mean, I would just say in relationship to the first part of your comment is that if you look at the history of the way in which the state performs its political theater is, uh, and here I'm thinking of the so-called liberal democracies of the Western world, uh, and their various uh, propped up imperial governments around the world as well, is that it's as if the state has the best interest of the citizenry in mind, and that therefore it's going to be the police that are somehow going to protect us against things like fascism and whatnot. But when you actually look at the material record, of course, there's an enormous complicity between these two. And at times then, and there's a famous case that occurred in France in Montpellier not that long ago, where it's you, uh, they're often the same people, right? Uh, uh, cop by day, you know, fascist by night, or on the weekend, or whatnot. In the case of Montpellier, they, uh, there was a student occupation, and the, during the occupation, the dean decided to open a back door and let in a bunch of hooded fascist black shirts with a taser uh, and a pallet, uh, you know, sticks of wood, to beat the students into submission until they left. And they successfully did that and then celebrated. And then the police orchestrated the exit for the fascist black shirts so that they couldn't be filmed by the students or held accountable in any way. And that type of relationship is, you know, of course, I might just be saying the obvious at this point in time, but it should be very clear about how those uh, forms of violence uh, uh, segue into one another. And uh, the question of then whether or not we go to the police for certain things is, I think, a really important question because we should know who we'd be going to, right? The, about the, the issue of, of different kind of forms of violence, I tend to be just a bit reticent insofar as picking up on Pierre's comment <coughs> earlier. If we want to understand violence as relational, 
uh, I don't know if it's very helpful to then identify different, you know, give a kind of typology of violence. It might be useful pragmatically in certain instances, so I'm not going to you know, make any grandiose universal claims, but I think that often how violence operates is it, it's about a force field of struggle, and in that force field there are different agencies that are operative. And so I wouldn't simply want to label them as one way or another and demarcate them, uh, at least in general, in those terms, if that's helpful. To more, maybe we can just work around, because there's a bunch of hands. So to more? Yeah, I just have kind of a, a comment, and then maybe like you can respond. But uh, in one of the pieces that was listed in the materials for today, I think a really good point was made, which is that violence is the, is the word violence is sort of uh, a big kind of red herring or distraction that allows like the mass media, you know, the ruling class essentially to kind of divert the conversation in a certain way uh, and keep it focused, like, for instance, on like the sort of tactics that the left are using, not so much on the right. Um, but I wonder if there's even like sort of another layer to that and it's sort of like our conversation today has largely been like about violence, to be fair. Like we've been mostly discussing like different types of violence and this sort of thing. Um, and it's also something that I've just noticed like with a lot of at least in Philadelphia, like a lot of the ways that like New Jersey Antifa and like Philly Antifa groups organize, I think there's a, a real like prob a real problem, I'll say, like to be perfectly honest, which is that um, this sort of I think street confrontations with fascists are, are important and necessary, but a lot of times uh, the sort of organizational, I think it's sort of, people tend to confuse tactics and strategy in a sense, uh, and think that this is sort of the, the final say is like street confrontations with fascists. And the fact is like, if we want to get rid of fascism, we have to confront not just the fascists in the streets, but also kind of abolish the conditions that give rise to fascism in general, and so that's sort of the you know, racist nature of capitalism, etc. Um, so, yeah, I guess what I, what, and another, another good point that uh, one of you brought up is that like, and this is also a sort of a, and of course like, again, I'm totally on board with like punching Nazis, I just think that's not quite necessarily the right question to be asking. Um, how do we begin to organize against the police and ICE? So, like one thing I always think about is like there's a lot of attention paid to like traditional workers party or like these sort of like out and out fascist groups. But like if I were a fascist, I wouldn't join any of those because like they do illegal stuff. It's it, it, they're kind of clowns like compared to the police and ICE who give who have like essentially like free reign to kill whoever they want and kidnap people and this sort of thing. So I guess um, my comment is just that like it would be nice if. This, if the conversation could sort of also uh, bring in these questions about like organization, because for instance, like uh, we say that like street confrontations with fascists are effective in many senses they are, but like uh, despite like having a huge paramilitary wing uh, of the German Communist Party back in the day, like the fact is they did fail. Like uh, Hitler took power eventually. So like I guess my the gist of my comment is like just to start thinking about like. What are the ways in which we can kind of bring in like the the darker nation, so to speak, as Du Bois would put it, or like uh, you know the black worker, or like these sorts of things? Because I think that like the anti pop movement in the U.S. is very like not is very disconnected from uh, like oppressed nationalities in a lot of ways, and like kind of hyper focused on this street confrontation thing, which I don't. I again, like I don't think it's bad, and I don't disagree with it, but it is kind of like almost like a like they're moralizing violence and like in some ways the response of the left has been also to have this sort of moralizing like we need to go out in the streets but the fact like that's not it can't be the whole strategy it especially probably can't even be like most of the strategy so i guess those are some like loosely connected thoughts and i wonder what you have to think uh, have to say about that well i mean it's interesting because um I, do you all know what happened in paris on may day Okay, so there was, there was a big, big march, and so I was talking to one of the organizers, and apparently, this I, I never knew this about Paris um, Manifestation, but there's a real orchestration between who marches first, who's second. I mean, the whole spatial element is very symbolic and pragmatically interesting. And so at that 
March, they let the Antifa people go first, which they then regretted because they did their thing, right? And they petrol bombed a, a McDonald's and the security, I, I, you, you probably know the security in Paris is just hyper alert now. So my wife and I were coming back at one o'clock the next morning. There was still police all over the place, right? So the second March uh, happened about a week or so ago. It was for um, saint Papier. And what they did then is they had two different streams meet at a certain point. So the Antifa was coming from one side and the more the Ouvrier and the saint Papier were coming. And so they, there was a way in which they managed the spatial political symbolism in a, in a way that diffused this. It was you know, very militarized in terms of the response, but it was fine in that sense. So I think what I'm trying to get at is that we have to think what the point is of the particular action, who the constituent parties are, and what, 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 what is the aim behind that. In terms of the police, um, uh, Patrice Coulard is one of the um, founders of Black Lives Matter said, has always said that one of the first ambitions is to never go to the police. I mean, the black community just has to have its own. And when you think about it, in, in, in historically, that that's the way that all minority communities in America start. I mean, the Chinese had their own, you know, Chinatowns and their own family associations. The Italians had, and so there was a real suspicion that the state was not out for your best interests. And the worst thing you could do would be to go to the police. And so you, you and so what they're trying to do in, in the black community, as far as I understand it, is to start to have not necessarily the same, not to reproduce the same structures, but the same sense of ownership of their community. Uh, and in terms of ICE, I think the, the fundamental thing that's happening in the United States now is resistance. I mean, just everybody is not turning into an informant. Everybody is, um, is frustrating those, those attempts because so much of what ICE is doing is, a, as I think I said earlier in my, in my presentation, is way beyond its, its it's, it's, it's portfolio. I mean, it's, it's not meant to do the things it's doing, but it's doing the most brutal and illegal and uh, terrible things because they know they have the protection of the White House. And so, and, and they, they don't have any, any breaks to them. So the best thing that one can do, I think, in this sense, is to frustrate it in every way possible. I'll just add two, or you want to jump in? I just want to add two things because it's a really important point and series of issues that you raised. One is coming back to the issue of violence. I think that it operates in a propagandistic way because it allows people to only talk about the means and ignore the ends. So you don't hear about, well, Antifa bombed the McDonald's because they're against global capitalism and against its fascist forms, right? You just hear about the bombing of the McDonald's. And that uh, and this then relates to your second and I think central point, and that is as organizers or people involved in politics in various ways, we have to be attentive to the extent to which violence is one of these operators, but there are many other operators that uh, function in such a way that politics and the mass media operate largely in harmony with one another in order to spin particular narratives. And violent street confrontations are not only sometimes red herrings in order to distract from other things, but they're also quite clearly orchestrated and manipulated in various ways. Because the best way to delegitimate a movement is you pin them in in certain ways that there are various reactions, and then you have the violence that the mass media can blame on the protesters. And I've seen Paris is like, they are, or the French, uh, um, riot police are specialists in this because what they do in cordoning off the streets is that they make sure that they control all access, uh, access and en uh, exit and entrance points. Mm -hmm. Then they begin to uh, strangle the entire movement so people can't get in or out. And what they're looking for is confrontation. And they're verbally aggressive. They're um, they do everything in their power, and they have an entire playbook on this in order to spark the violent, uh, you know, violent. Uh, response and thereby use the street confrontation as a justification for then propagandistically uh, laying blame on the entire, you know, the entire march failed because a few windows of McDonald's were, were, were broken. You should mention the whole reconstruction of Paris under Osman. Yeah, was part of it. For, you know, for sure. 
Yeah. Because that, that was it, destroying the conditions of possibility for barricades, right? And easy military deployment from one part of the city to the, to the next. And so the entire urban environment is, of course, set up in order to control these things. The final thing that I say, I mean, all these questions and comments are so rich that we could just spend four hours talking about each of them, is I really like the insistence on organizational questions because it is mm -hmm. one thing... It's like going to a protest or going to you know, punch a Nazi or sign a petition or whatever this is. The temporality of it is so intermittent mm -hmm. that it is largely disconnected from a long-term mode of organization in which you are doing multiple things, usually. You're strategizing, you're understanding how counter-revolutionary techniques work, you're mobilizing for things that will take place over time, and you're also trying to own the media narrative. Yeah. which is an extremely important part of organizing, meaning that you control your own media feeds, you have people who are doing media and outreach in various ways, um, because all of that is actually part of the political package. And so I couldn't agree more with this kind of, uh, it's a more robust understanding of what organizing is. It's uh, not intermittent, it's an entire life of collective planning in order to develop more power and strength over time. Um, do people, if people want to speak to these di uh, different points, I also don't want to kind of march through this in a, in a more traditional academic fashion. So, Pierre, did you, is that a hand to address these issues? Because we also don't have to, you know, the conversation can flow in multiple directions. Yeah. So people should jump in. Pierre, you want to talk to yeah. this, right? Uh, so and I'll have organizationally, there's a, in some sense a certain irony <coughs> to May 68 being the best manual for the police on how to uh, prevent any further reoccurrences of any such suspensions of, of order that was 68, right? So, in some sense, the question of um, the violent response to, well, the systemic violence would very much be connected with the question of the event, right? And May 68, I think, aside from the lack of consequences it had in actual politics, because very little reform was done and so in the history of ideas, it brought up very much the question of the event, right? And May 68, I think, still testifies to that eventual character. So what would be an event in uh, today's sense, given that the strategies that were available, for instance, for May 68 suspensions are not available in the same sense? Um, and can we perhaps... Collecting what, stra what strategies are you thinking of that aren't available? Well, mass strategies in the sense of mobilization, yeah. such as marches, not being possible in the very same way as they were in 68. I mean, already organizationally, May 68 had problems, for instance, in the fact that instead of occupying a TV, they yeah. occupied a bourgeois newspaper, uh, or uh, that they wanted to print the tracts on certain uh, printing methods that didn't allow them to reach a certain amount of, of tracts. So that was, in some sense, a reaction in, well, German 68-69 was very much, in some sense, a critique or reaction to the failures of 68 in France, and a lot of critiques were going against, well, the methods of organization. Um, so there, mm -hmm. since there seem to be like a couple of examples of recent events of activism that could come to mind and that could be, in some sense, helpful to think which media conditions we need to address and uh, which, in some sense, eventual characters or eventual dimensions we need to touch upon if we want to respond to this correctly. Did, did anybody watch Macron's speech today? No, I just heard the excerpts. <laughs> he's very good. And he's basically saying he's going to reboot the whole system. I mean, th this is almost the end point of not just 68, but 95, there were major strikes. The, it, it's going to be devastating because, you know, when you talk to people around Paris, you know, not, not necessarily, but I was on a train, there was, there was a strike, and um, the, the, he's manipulated, basically he said, um, do you know how much money these social pro programs cost? You know, like a shitload. It's a French, it's a vulgar French phrase. Like a shitload of money. And there's still poverty. So we basically, he says, we have to take care of old people, health system, and um, the, the challenge of exclusion. Those are the th which I thought the third one was interesting because, mm -hmm. but he's going to neoliberalize every. It's going to be a bulldozer. So in terms of re an organized response, I think that, you know, th the French have exhausted their traditional appeal, of, basically, we want to have a decent life, which was basically the message of '68. You know, we don't want to be, you know, twisted and mutilated, as they said at Berkeley, into this thing. You know, we want to live. We want to have decent vacations and, and pensions. 
all of that is now um, not is is beyond it's off the table. So and it's catching on in popular films and all this. So we're really at a very interesting uh, moment in France and and, and in, in the EU in general because there's also a Frexit moment movement now that there's a, a group in France that wants to withdraw from the uh, EU. So I think in terms of strategies of resistance, um, that this is going to be one of the real testing points um, in Europe. Now, do you want to, or Alejandro, do you want to talk to this? Yeah. Well, along, I was going to talk more, uh, or speak to the point that Tamar raised initially about thinking not only about, well, because in my head, Antifa uh, is mostly an organization that counters acts of terrorism and demonstration by right-wing extremists in the streets, right? And so I was thinking about this question of addressing the bigger element of the capitalist nexus between, well, the nexus between capitalism or like big firms, mm -hmm. you know, large-scale production, uh, the state, and of course the mass media apparatus. And Pierre kind of raised uh, a bit, sort of a very ephemeral tactic to address the sort of say the mass media apparatus, like occupying newspapers, right, or occupying newspaper prints. But I, speaking to this point of and it's a very large question, so I'm, I'm really trying to pick your brain on how you think about strategies to tackle the broader apparatus, right, rather than small acts of demonstration. Right. Well, the big apparatus, and I don't make, want to make you all paranoid, is the internet. I mean, when you think of what happened with Cambridge Analytica, I mean, that's most of the anti-file work takes place on the internet. And, and monitoring hate groups and their activities and all that. And you know that the, the fascists have their own internet now, right? Because they've been bumped off of religion. So they, this is what's going to be really uh, frightening in the way that they violate personal space. I mean, the, they, they dox. And the whole idea of Milos coming to Berkeley wasn't that it was an issue of free speech. He was going to come in and start um, exposing um, undocumented students. Mm -hmm. So it's an informational war as well. And I think that that's, that's the most uh, disturbing thing um, because we are so dependent on technology. Well, I was, I was going to speak more to um, sort of Gabriel's definition of fascism, right? Because mm -hmm. it seems to me that Gabriel defines institutions such as ICE or right. the prison industrial complex. Um, and obviously kind of more sure. permanent structures like the military and even at times the corporation and the way it affiliates itself to um, to the state as it carries out acts of violence as part of a bigger um, fascist mode of governance, right? Is that correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, well, the, the internet was invented by the military. Well, right. So, yeah. I mean, these things are not, not separate. Like they, they are, right. They're linked or linked, yeah. Right. I would just say more on the, the earlier question that you raised. There is the... Um, kind of important anarchist rallying point of de-link and rebuild. Right? What do you do with a corrupt system? We de-link and what that means is that instead of waking up every morning and reading the New York Times or plugging into the kind of extant apparatus, mm -hmm. you de-link from it, but you rebuild with other modes of organization. And so there are a million examples of this. Um, and it's not just anarchists, of course, who do this, but uh, alternative press networks, uh, the ones that David and I both publish in, are very important because they're not funded by the corporatocracy and because they provide a platform for information that is not vetted by uh, the corporate powers. Uh, but then that, that is, I think, one part of a much, much broader constellation. And I know that in my own organizing, in fact, the co-authored piece that I pre-circulated for uh, this session was developed in a kind of publicly resourced research collaborative, the Radical Education Department. And one of the things that we're invested in doing is, is precisely that, delinking from the modes of information that we have from the corporatocracy, the propaganda that goes into that, and the educational framework that comes with that. Because at the end of the day, the media probably educates us more than any other form of education. But then at the same time, to rebuild that in other ways in which you collectively resource intelligence, you do it in such a way that it's not about the privatized game of personal gain, you know, personal advantage advancement within a particular hierarchy like the academy or, or the press. In other words, that you try 
and you know, as much as possible in whatever corner of the world you are in, to develop alternative means of intellectual production. <coughs> and that, I think, is quite powerful in the big sense. Uh, I don't think that the radical education department itself is going to dismantle capitalism. Uh, I think that the world is much more complicated than that. But when you look at how capitalism emerged over the centuries, it was a very slow and gradual process, and there were tiny little workshops that were being transformed, etc. And so the dismantling of capitalism, I don't think, is going to come about with a messianic event, uh, unless perhaps the destruction of, I mean, the destruction of capitalism might be the destruction of the biosphere. That's the one proviso that I would add. Um, the true end of history, I would say. Not the one predicted by Fukuyama, but the cosmological end of history inscribed within capitalism itself. But short of that, I think the dismantling of capitalism will be something like the emergence of capitalism, which is a metastatic transformation. Which is, uh, which is I think, a really interesting point to raise on sort of the 50th anniversary of 68, right? Which is, I think, kind of the, the end point of this mode of thinking about the dismantling of capitalism is this, like, massive revolution that was going to overthrow the entire apparatus and let go. So I think yeah. Well, but I think the, uh, a lot of the original impetus to 68 in, in France, for instance, but it's the same in a lot of the German and Italian student movements, it was anti-imperialist, right? That's where a lot of it came from, on the heels of the Algerian, uh, the war in Algeria for France, but then the Vietnam War was a big rallying point. But it was also such a crucially important moment because of the ways in which there was an identification of a need to struggle against capitalism, but not necessarily within the structures of the Communist Party, right? Mm -hmm. So you have the, uh, oh, it's, a, it's the, a kind of flashpoint for a radical non-communist left mode of organizing, a lot of it inspired by anarchists, uh, but also various forms of indigenous organizing, anti-colonial organizing, etc. cetera. Yeah. Yeah. I had one last intervention with regard to that point. Um, I thought that, um, I think that the really interesting distinction for me between sort of thinking about um, the relationship between fascism and liberalism mm -hmm. isn't necessarily the distinction between Europe and the United States, but the distinction between sort of the West and the post-colonial state, mm -hmm. right? In the sense that, uh, in the experiences that I'm familiar with, which are um, the experiences of you know, Mexico, and I think I can speak to some degree to the experience of the Middle East, is that um, those experiences, I think, make me think of the relationship between the two not as cyclical, not as complementary, but cyclical, right? And that's because, at least in the Mexican experience, the attempts to, neo to really neoliberalize the economy have, um, especially sort of um, as they heated up in the 1990s and then in a second wave from 2000 to 2010, um, led to the disintegration of the state monopoly and violence, right? First with the Zapatistas mm -hmm. in the 90s, and uh, which was neoliberalization both um, kind of politically and, ec and economically, um, and later between 2000 and 2010, where you really see, um, I think, such a degree of popular despair at the inability of the current system to kind of provide um, sort of bread and butter that people resort to paramilitary organizations, right? And, and that, of course, that does bring out sort of once again the, um, the state response to that in kind, but I think, I think that response only sharpens the ever decreasing differential in power between the new paramilitary organization that arises and the state itself. So for me, that, I don't know, that, that, that experience always makes me think of this not necessarily. Like I said, not as a complimentary thing, but just as a one. Yeah, I think I would just add to that that I think it's a very important point that uh, there are, and you see it, I mean, there are many very, very good examples of it, particularly within the kind of the uh, history of nation states formerly colonized by Euro America. Uh, those cycles, though, for instance, from a quote unquote liberal democracy, for instance, to a dictatorship, mm -hmm. often then have to do with the larger global political and economic dynamic, right? The history of dictatorships in Latin America is the history of US intervention in Latin America, right. the same thing. Um, and so those cycles, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to naturalize them for one, 
and I would also then want to situate them in this broader power field, but also recognize that under liberal modes of governance, in particular nation states, there's always populations, usually the, the lumpen proletariat or the, and the, the migrant populations and whatnot, whose mode of governance is fascism, if it's under a liberal democracy or not. And there are great examples of people who say, well, you know, life under a dictatorship or life under a liberal democracy didn't really make any difference to my life because my life was always governed by fascistic modes. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of it has to do with the socioeconomic class and its relationship to the, the centers of power. Yeah. Well, you should also tell us more about, you know, because the, the event in Mexico City in 68, I mean, the, the killing of the students was, was you know, the fundamental, I mean, because every instantiation of 68, but, but this was probably the bloodiest state-sponsored violence. That, you know, I don't yeah. know how many hundreds of students were killed. It was just, and it's passers-by. It was, it, was, it was an explosion of state violence. Get back to us, but I mean, it, yeah. That's actually really fascinating um, to think of 68 as um, the as a largest example of a sort of state sponsored violence against students. Mm -hmm. Because I think there are, um, there are very recent examples yeah. of student violence that are so much fresher in, the, in popular memory and yeah. how much the state um, no longer controls as directly, if you will, the production of sort of um, mass media, mm -hmm. right? Such that I think even though less students died, it goes back to your stockpile of amnesia, amnesia mm -hmm. points, mm -hmm. right? Even though less students, um, have died recently, particularly in 2013, 2012. Mm -hmm. um, it is much more fresher and more, much more poignant in the minds of students, in the minds of the population, right? Because um, every detail of how the state sponsored up that violence against the disappeared 43 um, was kind of publicly aired, right? Whereas what happened in 68, I think, um, but that, I, yeah. I think what happened yeah. in 68 was far less publicized within Mexico, um, and it was so confined to a, it was so confined to Mexico City and to mm -hmm. Mexico mm -hmm. City intelligentsia right. yeah. that it doesn't, um, doesn't yeah. have the same potency right. outside of certain circles. Yeah. Natalie, did you want to? Yeah. <clears throat> um, I was kind of thinking about this where this discussion has now gone a little bit, uh, around securitization policy and sort of why we should be violent. Um, because if you look at how securitization security policy works for nation states, basically they have an imagined enemy that they then preemptively legislate against, right? So we're already indexed as terrorists, and I hope everyone's part of that week, but maybe they don't interpolate it. But, um, and so reading Mark Neoclius' book called uh, The Universal Adversary, which is a shift from um, the function of terrorist and policy to the universal adversary. So we kind of exhausted the, the role that um, the terrorist can serve in sort of geopolitical discourse. Um, and so that brings in all of these kind of figures in history as enemies that have had to be eradicated through state violence, like the pirate, women as witches, um, and in more recent discourse, the disgruntled worker. So because my work on ports looks at them as um, extra legal economic spaces, even a worker's strike is considered tantamount to domestic terrorism. Um, and so I'm kind of thinking about that that's already happening as a, a situation that we need to not stand still in. And so how they imagine us as a threat that impacts or acts as this impetus for writing policy preemptively and I kind of I guess want to question how people think about the possibility of um, becoming the threat that they imagine us to be when they legislate against us. And so like you were saying um, here that 68 was a handbook for policing. If you read security policy it's a handbook for us as well. I mean they run through war games of a whole series of threats that could happen and exactly how they would respond and it's terrifyingly accessible to, to read and find out and so yeah I kind of am interested in that kind of question that the, the, the question of whether or not you should be violent or act on these kind of scales isn't just on that interpersonal level but it's, they're already acting on us and trying to kind of contain and legislate us out of existence and eradicate those 
um, opportunities to even be violent. And so I think that's one of the main emphasis for why we should embrace it. I think those are great. I would just say that the, uh, and it comes back to Tamor's point as well, I think that good organizers need to have a good offense and a good defense. Meaning that there are a lot of people who have street tactics and they know how to organize things in, when they go on the offensive, but knowledge about how securitarian forces operate and how they infiltrate, how they um, run smear campaigns in the media and all of that is enormously powerful insofar as then you can, like you say, you read their security books and then you have the playbook by which you know, you know, either how you can avoid being ensnared within their apparatus or you can use their apparatus against itself. And I think that's very important. The only other thing that I would say is that I do think that securitarianism, which is not security, right? Securitarianism is... It's, it's like this self-fulfilling prophecy of sorts, and I think that a lot of the contemporary discourse and practice operates in this way, because ultimately under a regime of securitarianism, you can never be secure. Like, the whole discourse is that there is a threat that's out there, and so you have to beef up the security apparatus to such an extent that the security apparatus will, through a self-fulfilling prophecy, ensure that someone will be found who is performing some type of criminal act, and usually due to the securitarian nature of things, it will be provoked, right? The number of quote-unquote terrorist attacks in the United States that were due to FBI informants basically taking activists by the hand, putting bombs made by the FBI in their hands, and then you know, taking them to the site, and usually the activists saying, no, I'm not so sure about this, I'm a little nervous about this. There's, the statistics on this are, are phenomenal. Uh, it's the mass majority, for sure. And so I think that we also have to come to terms, and that's some of the kind of intellectual work that needs to go into organizing. How can we understand securitarianism and how it operates uh, in all of its various forms? So I think it's a really important point. Leandro, I know that it, uh, no. you know, the floor is open, but I know that Leandro had a question or comment. Um, yeah, it was and you work on securitari security, so. Yeah, no, I was thinking on, on something of the sort. Um, when you were talking about um, delinking and rebuilding, right, and the problems of the platforms of when you're using, for example, uh, the internet, and you were thinking about this, the maximum apparatus as well, and um, the question of question about legibility, because I don't know how it works in the US, but for example, in Argentina, it has been proven that um, the state is hiring people that just go and uh, with uh, whatever uh, demonstration it is and uh, perform violent acts of different sorts, actually. In the now we're going, we have this Trump president there, and so it's just going you know, really stuff. And so there was this cut off on the uh, social security in December, and there was massive demonstration. There were 300,000 people on the streets, actually. And um, it was really peaceful, only just one part of the of the demonstration was actually violent and throwing stones. And one of the people that was hidden, uh, that was hurt by the police, was actually a police in disguise, right? right? And that was proven. There's pictures of the guy, there's a police, there's a that. And so what happens when you're actually advertising, here we, here we are all gathering at this place, and how do you deal with that ability? And then also what happens is that I completely, of course, I appreciate alternate media, and I get my info from there, but at the same time, I think it's not only a problem of information, because what happens is um, the media does not only provide information, but constructs a certain image in a very particular way that responds to the logic of the spectrum, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so from there, it's, it's what happens always with at least the left in Argentina. Why are we losing? Because people are not, it's not a matter of reason, it's not a matter of having better arguments, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and your government, actually, we call them the, the balloon stupids because um, and supporters because um, it won with it won only because of this, but they had a strong campaign using balloons, <laughs> you know, because I talk about like and, and bouncing castles for I don't know how we call them in English, but like kids and they could come in the campaign and stuff. And so those two questions for me are very important in terms of what kind of platforms and where and how and then the problems of distribution. I, mean, I want to jump on that immediately. But no, please, go ahead. Well, I'll, I'll try to keep it short. Sorry, the really, really great questions and comments, so I feel like I can't shut up. Um, one is I think it's so important to engage in multiple levels of discourse and practice. So in my own life, I write for, uh, you know, under pseudonyms for completely out-of-the-way out places that probably five people read but I also try to write entirely differently 
for venues like the New York Times, which is a neoliberal bastion but has the reach, right? And this is just one instance, it's the same with you know, cultural practices and whatnot. Instead of limiting our agency, as often people have done on the left, they say that, well, there's one tactic that works and you have to do this, and making, for instance, a film for the mass population is more important than making some fringe film. I say, why not do both? Uh, why not multiply our agency so that we can operate at different levels and intercede in those different levels? Because I fully agree with what you said about kind of knowing the logic of the spectacle and then thinking about ways in which you might want to engage with that in order to harness its power but for alternative ends. Mm -hmm. And it raises enormous questions about the role of aesthetics as a potential site and important site of intervention for redistributing what it is that people might regularly perceive through the spectacle apparatus. And there's phenomenal work that's been done on precisely, precisely this. So I couldn't agree more with the kind of invitation to not only think about it, but also do some of these things.